As you leave the station and cross the river, you'll see Stirling Castle, a stronghold built high on the eroded edge of an immense sheet of what was once molten rock, known as magma. The magma was forced up through the Earth's crust around 300 million years ago. A similar outcrop on the other side of the Firth of Forth is the setting for the Wallace Monument. This unusually shaped tower was built in the 1860s to commemorate William Wallace, who led the Scots to victory against the English here in 1297. As your train carries you across the large flat landscape of drained farmland, with the River Forth meandering nearby, it's almost impossible to realise that this area was once underwater. At the end of the last glaciation, only seven miles of dry land joined the northern two-thirds of Scotland to the rest of the country. The relative sea level was higher, so the coast extended 20 miles further inland than it does today. Just imagine, this was once all sea, and sea so deep that whales could swim in it. We know that because when the land was cleared and drained in the 1800s, labourers sometimes turned up a skeleton of a beached whale enveloped in the blue-grey clays several metres down. One was found in 1819, which was over 20 metres, or 72 feet long. The North Sea used to be a haven for a great variety of whales, including fin, blue and minke. Gradually, the sea levels changed, transforming this landscape. As the broad estuary silted up around 6,500 years ago, a vast, extraordinarily thick peat bog developed here. Much of it was over six metres deep. There's very little left of it today, as the ever-changing land was altered once more by the agricultural improvers of the 19th century. They drained the peat bog and fertilised the silts and clays they exposed, creating the arable fields you can see from the train window. Today, the only area of peatland that survives to any depth is Flanders Moss, a few miles inland from the train line. As one of the largest intact raised bogs in the whole of the UK, it's a national nature reserve. Ian and Francois are involved in its management. Flanders Moss is a lowland raised bog and uh, actually it's a, it's a bigger stretch of uh, raised bog habitats close to naturalness, you know, to be found in the UK. So one of the reasons that it's so important is that raised bogs are now more endangered than rainforests, which a lot of people don't realise. There's, there's a number of specialist yeah. species. Because it's such a specialist habitat, the species that live there are very much designed to live there and over thousands of years have learned how to live there. Um, the sphagnum itself couldn't exist many other places other than those sorts of conditions. And there's many other types of species there that love mosses and bogs, such as dragonflies and damselflies. And we have a lot of birds there, like snipe and stone chats come in as well, and we get red starts. And, Birch is a sort of pioneer species which automatically wants to grow on Flanders moss. The, the downside to this is that they drink a lot of water and uh, the bog needs the water. It's, we need to keep the, the water table as high as we can to allow sphagnum moss to grow, which is what lays down peat. So the less trees we have, the better it is for the bog. Last summer was brilliant. Seasonally, there's something to see at Flanders moss all year round. In the summertime, you have damselflies and dragonflies and lizards and adders and in the winter time you have pink-footed geese, uh, whooper swans. The morning chorus you see uh, during springtime is, is usually fantastic at, uh, at Flanders. If you wake up quite early and have a wee spy you see that, then that's where you make your day. Eh? A wetter bog is a better bog for most wildlife, so Flanders moss is a habitat that should become even richer over the next few decades.